Um, yeah, so thanks for the introduction. Uh, as he said, my name is William Woodall. I'm a software engineer at Open Robotics. Um, I am one of the people you have to blame for the executors that exist in ROS2. Um, my, my hope with this talk is to, um, well, I have an overview here. My hope is to do two things. One is to uh, give an overview to people so that we're all on the same page. For a lot of the people presenting here and a lot of people who will probably be involved in the discussion, uh, this probably won't be new information to them, but hopefully you know, uh, it'll clear up any misconceptions that people have, get us on the same page terminology-wise and stuff like that, but also as a benefit to the attendees of the workshop, um, just so they have a foundation uh, to better understand these talks that are going to come after. Um, so this is uh, part of the, the point. The other part is to kind of motivate um, kind of a personal opinion of mine, which is that we don't need eight executors. We don't want 16, but I doubt we will ever get to just one executor because there are just too many different use cases and competing interests. Uh, so I want to start by just talking about what's the traditional ROS approach. This is what everyone's going to be familiar with. It's used ROS in the ROS one or ROS two in the past, the standard ROS two in the past. Um, so you know, of course, you have a situation where you're going to create a subscription to a topic, um, and you're going to say you're going to give it a callback. In this case, we're using a lambda. We're going to say when there's a message available on this topic. <clears throat> excuse me. Um, I want you to call my function and I'm going to do something with it. Uh, this is one message at a time. It's as soon as the message is received. It's pretty straightforward. Um, usually you'll have a main function. Sometimes the user will write this. Sometimes it, they won't write this. But you have something like this where you say, I want to spin on that node that I created. And, and for people who have used ROS before, they know that that middle line spin is where all the work happens. But what you may not know is that under the hood, that uses an executor, which is part of what we're here to talk about, or is what we're here to talk about today. And there's a lot baked into that spin function. So if you're using spin, you're using an executor, you just don't realize it, you're actually using a single threaded executor. The single threaded executor is pretty lightweight. It doesn't create any threads, um, despite the name. Uh, it doesn't doesn't do any kind of multi-threaded synchronization with locks or anything like that or, or semaphores. Um, it simply uses the thread that it's in uh, to do the execution work. So when, when messages are ready, it waits for messages to be ready and then executes the user's code uh, as needed. Um, and we'll get into a little more detail of that. But first I wanna talk about execution in general, not specifically necessarily about executors, though this covers that, but just in general. So in a system, an asynchronous system like ROS, you have things that you need to act upon asynchronously, events essentially. In ROS, we have a bunch of different ones. We have subscriptions and services, both the client side and the server side, uh, the ones making the requests and the, the ones uh, fielding those requests with responses. Uh, we have timers and we have some things like QS events, um, things like deadline missed, liveliness lost, things like things that happen asynchronously. And so the big problem is we have a lot of things that could happen at any given time. Uh, and we don't know which one's going to happen next because it depends on timing in the system, the network, a bunch of other things. Um, and we need to wait for one or more of them to be ready so that we can do something with them. Um, and so this is the core of the problem, is deciding how do we wait on those things? When do we decide to act upon them? If there's more than one thing ready to be acted upon, what order do we act upon them in? So there are two major approaches to the when part of that question. Um, uh, at large, you know, we're not the first system to have asynchronous uh, events and needing to handle them. Uh, and there's two major approaches out there. There's the proactor pattern and the reactor pattern. So the reactor pattern is probably something more people are familiar with. Uh, if you've ever written uh, a select call 
to select across sockets, uh, or you've ever used probably, uh, um, you know, KQ or EPOL or one of these other kind of low level, I have a bunch of file handles or a bunch of sockets and I want to know when one or more of them is ready to read or write. That pattern is that the user waits for one of them to one or more of them to be ready to be done, but then the user actually takes the step to read or write to them and in what order they decide. The proactor pattern uh, is different. The proactor pattern, the user is waiting for a read or a write to be completed or some action associated with the event to be completed. And the system calls the user back when that reading and writing is done. So ROS2 and ROS1 uh, standard practice that we were just looking at before are examples of proactor pattern. The system waits for something to be ready. When it's ready, it go ahead and reads it, and then it takes the result of that and then delivers that to the user. Um, but what we'll probably see here today is that a, a lot of needs are better serviced uh, by a reactor pattern where the user waits and then sees what's ready and then makes some decisions about when to act on those things and in what order. Um, but other examples of this um, are the DDS listener API is a proactor pattern. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar, uh, the listener API is, is very similar to what you would experience in ROS where you say, you tell DDS, hey, when this event happens, uh, here's a function to call. Uh, and it will give you the data associated with that event if there's any to be associated with it. On the reactor side, uh, what a lot of people who use ROS2 will not probably be aware of is that under the hood, uh, we have um, a reactor system. So at the, at the RMW layer where we interface ROS with DDS, the only thing that exists at the moment actually is, um, is a reactor pattern where we have, we say, here's a list of things to wait on. Tell me when one or more of them is, um, is ready to be acted upon. And those in DDS, both DDS and ROS2, that's referred to as a wait set, a set of things to be waited on. And so I talked about this a little bit already, um, but in an executor, a proactor design, the data is taken by the system and given to the user. Uh, and in a wait set approach, the data is waited for by the user, but then is, is also taken by the user. And the consequence of this is that in an executor or any proactor design, um, scheduling, that is to say, think, you know, if you have more than one thing, let's say you have a timer that's ready to be executed and you've got data on two different subscriptions, two different topics, uh, and all of that is ready to go right now, um, scheduling, what I mean is, when I say scheduling is, Okay, and what in that situation, in what order do I take those things and in what order do I execute them and when do I do it? And with a proactor pattern, that is built into the system. Now, the user might be able to influence the behavior of the executor. They may be able to pick a scheduler, they may be able to give hints to the executor uh, or similar construct implementing this pattern and say, like, what should go first? You might have like a priority system, you may have, you know, whatever. Um, but with the wait set approach, it's different. The wait set approach um, is a reactor pattern. The user waits for something to be ready. And then the user has all the information. They can see, okay, you know, X, Y, and Z thing are ready to go. And then they can make their own decisions about which one to do first, um, how to batch them together, things like that. So some of you may not be aware, uh, but there is, um, a wait set class in RCL CPP. It's been there since Foxy. Um, and uh, that's not super important, I, but I hear I wanted to just give an example of how you might use a wait set since I already gave an example of what it looks like to use the proactor pattern, you know, with just a callback, you know, the standard ROS kind of approach to this problem. Um, so here's an example using the C++ wait set um, in RCL CPP. It's a little bit cumbersome, still kind of a work in progress. One of the weird things here you'll notice in the first part of the left-hand box is that um, subscriptions still have a callback even though they don't get called in this situation. 
Uh, so I've got like a do nothing callback that has an assert in it. William, we can't hear, hear you anymore. Can you hear me? Uh, yes, we can. Yes, yes, we can. Okay. We have to signal William somehow. Um, maybe now, let me take his presentation. <laughs> William, can you hear us? William! <laughs> we can't hear you anymore. Oh, can you hear me now? Yeah, better. Yeah. How long? Yeah. How long have I yeah. been talking without? Uh... Um, in, in the chat, the last thing that was audible was uh, the do nothing callback. <laughs> ah, sorry, sorry. Uh, okay. Good I think my I think my headset disconnected. Let me plug it again. Um, <laughs> sorry. So let me go back really quickly. So so the do nothing callback, like I said, that's pretty awkward. Um, we're still working on making the subscription better used in this situation where you're not using it with an executor. Um, uh, but since I already showed how to do this with um, uh, with the executor pattern, kind of the pro actor pattern with the callback and everything, I wanted to show how you could do it with the weight set approach, the reactor set. So uh, anyways, so at the very beginning, you can see um, the I'm, we're creating two subscriptions here and two guard conditions. And in the second block, um, uh, you can see that we're creating a weight set and we're going ahead and giving it one subscription and guard condition initially. You can see in the third block, you can also add them afterwards. There's actually also a static weight set that's not shown here that can only be initialized in the constructor and then afterwards can't be changed. Um, if that's uh, what you would prefer, uh, can pre-allocate some of the storage and stuff like that. It's not dynamic at all. Um, and so anyways, the right-hand side shows just quickly how uh, a user might use this, um, so they would call, they, you know, they got this wait set that they've added things to, and then they would call wait with a timeout uh, optionally, and uh, it would wait for something to have become ready or for that timeout to expire. And then you can see afterwards we have this like if else case statement system, which you could also use a switch statement here. Um, and so you can see that it can be ready, it can be timed out, which is, you know, there are things in the wait set, but none of them became ready by the time you, uh, for the during the duration that you asked, uh, and then it can be uh, empty if you if you wait on an empty wait set. That's a special condition, um, and so um, the um, in the case that it's ready, it's up to the user to figure out what is ready. So here's just a simple example of it iterating over the subscriptions. Um, and seeing if any of them are uh, not null pointer. Uh, that's how the, it communicates what's ready. You put in a bunch of pointers for things to wait on. And when it uh, returns, if anything is ready, there'll be non-null in that original list. Um, and so if one of them is ready, you can uh, call take on the subscription. And um, take is uh, how you can get the, most recent message out of a subscription without using the callback. And so here you've manually taken a message and uh, you can do with, with, with it whatever you'd like. Um, but you could imagine doing something more sophisticated than this where if you have multiple subscriptions ready, you could have some logic saying, well, okay, 
you know, if this subscription A is ready, let's take from it first always, uh, and then only then afterwards we could take from this other subscription B or something something like that. And that kind of logic of which one do I take from if there are multiple options, timers, subscription services, which one of each, that kind of logic is baked into the executors typically, uh, or, or there's a way for the user to control it, but it's part of the executor interface. The user doesn't typically write this code directly, though I think later today we'll see approach that's kind of in between a little bit. So I talked a little bit about how the executor works. Um, it essentially uses a very similar set of code to the code that I just showed you to achieve what it does. Um, but I just wanted to make it clear in case it wasn't, it's, it's kind of a straightforward concept of what it does, but just to be thorough. So when you call spin on an executor, the first thing it's going to do is create a wait set and it's going to add all the things that the executor cares about waiting on, whether it be subscriptions, timers, services, other events, anything like that. Um, and then after it's added everything to the wait set, it's going to wait for something to be ready. Uh, and then when at least one thing is ready, uh, that might be immediately, that might be after waiting for a while. Um, it's going to determine uh, through some implicit scheduling uh, which thing to take from. And then it's going to, if it's a subscription or a service, it's going to take some data, a message, a request, a response, something uh, from, from the object. In this case here, I've got a subscription uh, in the view. Uh, and then it's going to take that data it took from the subscription and it's going to pass it to the user so that the user can use it in their callback. And when the user's callback is done, the executor will do it all over again. Um, and that's this this is a simplistic version of what the of, of what the single threaded executor does. So what I haven't mentioned yet is another uh, aspect of the executor, which uh, again, uh, differentiates it from the, um, the reactor pattern, which is that um, we have this concept of callback groups. And so for those of you who aren't familiar, um, the hierarchy of things uh, in ROS2 is that you have a node, and then from a node, uh, a node contains uh, one or more uh, callback groups and callback groups contain one or more subscriptions, services, timers, anything that can be waited on. Um, and the reason for this callback group structure is essentially a way for the person writing the domain specific logic of the node to indicate to the execution system, to the executor, um, what what callbacks can be run at the same time as other callbacks and which ones cannot. Um, and this allows you to have nodes which are developed independently from the execution, uh, which means that the, the node itself is not doing things like creating threads or managing those threads. Um, and instead it just says what it wants to execute and which things can and can't be executed together at the same time. And then the execution system can do the execution. The benefit of this is that if you have many nodes written this way, you could pool them together and have them share an execution uh, resource like a multi-threaded executor or even a single-threaded executor. Then you could think, well, why do I need to do that? I could just make sure that if two callbacks access the same uh, you know, shared resource that I just lock them so that they don't do it at the same time. That's safe and it is safe. And we have this in ROS1. Um, in, no, in the nodelet design. Um, but what that could lead to is what I've, I've shown in this first diagram here on top. So imagine you have a node with a callback and a node uh, with a second callback and then a second node with a callback. And as far as the system's concerned, all of them can run at the same time, same time as themselves, whatever. And let's say that you have two threads. Well, if node one's callback one is a subscription that has a high frequency set of data coming in and a long callback time, let's say you're processing images at 30 hertz and you're doing something significant in the callback, um, but that callback can't be run at the same time. So let's maybe say that you're using the data from that image to update a map that is shared somehow, right? So you lock access to that map. You can get into a situation where both of your threads and your thread pool 
are are trying to execute that callback one of them is executing and holding the lock but the other one is just waiting on that lock to do execution in the meantime you may have other things you could do like a timer has fired or data has come in from a different topic and that second thread could be executing those things but it's not it's just waiting and so you've effectively starved out some of your callbacks and then the second diagram you can see how this can be addressed with um with the callback groups by saying you know node one callback one and node one callback two they access a shared resource uh, is implicitly what you're saying there when you put them in the same mutually exclusive callback group you're telling the system they can't be run at the same time and so the system in this in this case the system is the executor the executor won't try to execute them simultaneously that leaves the threads uh, other threads in the thread pool freed up to do other things while it's waiting for that condition to be met. Um, other asynchronous systems like ASIO and stuff, they have similar ideas, uh, but nothing exactly like this. Um, ASIO has this concept of threads where you have a bunch of tasks that happen one after another, so it won't try to execute things later in the thread until it executes the ones early on to avoid exactly this problem of resource starvation. Um, when you have lots of things happening and limited thread resources. Um, but anyways, that's that's what a callback group is. Later uh, today, I think we'll have a talk where someone, um, I think Ralph talks about how um, uh, you can use this uh, to your advantage to actually completely separate execution. So you can have a single node with multiple callbacks and you can put some callbacks in one callback group and some callbacks in another callback group and you can actually have a separate executor for each callback group and you could do things like have a high priority thread or a low priority thread or you could just simply keep them separated so they never interfere with one another um, and and things like that so it's it's just a way to organize execution of things that can be weighted on within a node uh, more granularly than the node itself so I'm, I'm trying to wrap up here because I think I'm a little bit over with the whole muting debacle, which let me just make sure that doesn't happen again. Um, but quickly, I wanted to recap what, what the current state of affairs is and what we might do in the future. So as Michael alluded to in the intro, um, we currently have a bunch of different executors. The three that are currently in RCL CPP are the single threaded executor, the multi-threaded executor, and the static single threaded executor. So the single threaded executor and the multi threaded executor have been there from the beginning. Uh, I think I wrote them originally. There are all kinds of problems with them. Uh, they're inefficient and um, uh, they're not deterministic and uh, the scheduling is implicit and probably not ideal. Uh, it's not fair at all. It's just very uh, um, prescriptive, um, but uh, and then we have the static single thread executor, which is more or less just like the single threaded executor, except it uses a different approach for how to build the weight sets each loop and is just more efficient. Um, there were some lingering issues with, with uh, the behavior of it uh, that made us cautious to replace the single threaded executor with it, um, but it is something that we still want to do um though we would like to probably rewrite it and the multi-threaded executor uh with the uh c++ weight set um class um at some point as well so there's some drawbacks to these executors one like i said they don't expose scheduling there's an implicit scheduling happening with each of them uh, you could inherit from them and override some of the methods uh to control how to change how the scheduling works but it's not straightforward to do and uh, we don't have any like out of the box schedulers to pick from uh, so it would be a lot of work for a user to change that and the default scheduling that we use is probably not the best one we could use by default as i mentioned the armw rcl weight set interface is kind of inefficient uh, and there's been a lot of work to try to figure out how to work around that inefficiency uh, or to skip it all together um, and it also only simply support simple callback options. So like I said, you can get callback when there's a new message, you can get a callback when there's a new request or response when a timer is fired, but you can't do things like, I want to process all messages that have come in since the last time I did a process when a timer expires or when a message arrives on a specific topic. There's not a lot of triggering options 
uh, you can imagine like you could get a call back with a list of messages from various topics um, uh, based on some arbitrary trigger, um, but it doesn't do that. It only lets you, uh, you know, get a single callback for a single message on a single topic or service or timer or something like that. Um, and it's deeply tied into the to the structure of things like subscription, which whose constructor take a callback and things like that. Um, so in the future, like I said, we'd like to replace the single threaded executor with the static one. We'd like to use the RCLCVP wait set. Um, we also uh, will also hear about a events-based executor later and the underpinning to that is a more uh, listener style uh, interface for the ARM RMW API, where rather than building a wait set and waiting on it and then it returning to us and us looking at what's ready and all of that, it's more like Windows IOCP where you say, here's a function, call it when this thing is ready. Um, and that might let us be more performant. Um, I would love to see a RCL CVP wait set that is driven by that interface and see what the performance of that is and then build other executors on top of that. Um, and as I said at the beginning, um, I would like to reduce the number of executors in RCL CVP down to two again, a, a single threaded and a multi-threaded. Uh, but I do not think that is all the kinds of executors we will need. Um, hopefully today you'll see that there are trade-offs in performance and determinism and scheduling um, order and behavior that um, will drive use cases in different directions and that there are enough competing interests that there will never probably be one executor to rule them all. And the best thing we can do is reduce the number, have the defaults that are there be as good as possible uh, for the for the majority of use cases, and then document well which ones you should use in which which scenarios. And with that, that's everything I had. Thanks a lot, William. For what I forgot to mention um, when I started, so there there's a Q and A chat. So please ask your questions in the in the Q and A box. And after each talk, we will pick uh, roughly two questions and answer them live. And the other questions then will be answered later in the chat by the presenters. So, William, we have um, two questions. Do you plan to provide um, basic scheduling implementation? Yeah, so um, that I would love to do that. We don't have plans to do it right this second. Um, but uh, two things. One is we could definitely do better than, and I think this basically answers the second question, right, <clears throat> as well. Um, Basically, uh, we would love to do that. Uh, we don't have plans to do it right now. The current scheduler is not ideal. The current one always executes timers before subscriptions and subscriptions before services. And so if you're in a situation where a timer is going really, really quickly, you could make it, you get into a situation where you never service a subscription because you're always servicing timers. And that's not a fair schedule, right? Um, and as anybody who's looked into scheduler options knows, uh, it's a complicated field. You know, Linux itself has many scheduler approaches. Um, and so I think that the best option there is to have different options for the user when they create the executor and have a good default. And I think currently our default is neither good nor do we have multiple options. So that's definitely something we need to improve. And I think that maybe to a lesser degree, I haven't really thought about it, but I think for most of the executors we'll see today, having some control over the scheduling behavior will be useful unless the user is the one doing the scheduling directly. 